I'd love to have a conversation with you about abortion and about the good news of the gospel. Would you be willing to talk with us for a moment? Y'all know abortion is in the Tanakh, right? Well, we know it's spoken of and God says life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. In Exodus 21, 22 through 25, if you look at that passage, it talks about two men are fighting one another and a pregnant woman gets in between and if the baby gets hit and it gets killed, then he shall pay life for life. So yeah, in the Torah and in the Tanakh, it does say that the baby inside the womb is of equal value as the life outside of the womb. None of you have a uterus. Why do you care? Uh, do you care about the Jews that were slaughtered in the Holocaust? I do. You're not a Jew. Why do you care? Or are you a Jew? How did you... Okay. Do you see the logic, though? Like, I can say that the Holocaust was wrong, objectively wrong, because it's wrong to murder an image bearer of God. So it affects me and it affects this nation when we're taking the lives of innocent children. God tells us to rescue those who are being led to the slaughter, to hold them back, to save them. And so it is my business because we are called to rescue, because God the Father is a rescuing God. And God rescued me from the domains of darkness and transferred me into the kingdom of the beloved Son, and now I have forgiveness of sins because of what He's done. You also know that God is a war God, right? Uh, the heavenly host is an army. That's yeah. what the host means. Sure, that's fine. I'm very anti-war personally. Sure. Um, the thing is, God is just, right? How do we know? We know because if God's not just, we can't even define what justice is. He's the objective standard of what is just and good and holy. And if we reject the revelation of God and we say, we don't care what God says. We're not going to be Christians. We're not going to hold to the Word of God as the ultimate authority. We're just autonomous man, making up our own laws, our self-laws. And so we need an absolute standard of truth, and that's found in the Word of God. So I don't it's a, think there is an absolute standard of truth, just by the nature of truth itself. Well, this conversation presupposes that you believe in objective truth, because we couldn't get anywhere if you didn't believe in objective truth. You're fighting for something. I'm not sure what that is at this moment but you're talking with us, which I'm very grateful for, but even having conversation, reasonable debate, presupposes objective truth. I, I don't mean to be disrespectful looking at my phone. I'm just, no, you're fine. I've got an exam soon, so... Sure. Would you be, or if you want to talk to us longer, you can, but would you be willing to take some of these? I've already got... One. You got one? Okay, you got one. Would you be willing to take this one? Maybe put it in your bag? Okay. All right. Dude, Did you have an... Sight. Yeah, it's not... We don't like sharing them, but that's the reality of what's going on in abortion. And so you said you're a person who's not of war. Um, I mean, this is really a wicked thing that we would demolish a baby. You can see it's clearly a baby. So, um, like I said, we hate showing it, but we have to bring awareness to what our nation is doing. And it is objectively wrong to murder. I... I have hesitations about the issue of abortion, mostly because, what's your stance on day after pills? We would, well, we would say that the moment of fertilization, and this is even what the scientists and the embryologists would agree with um, on this issue, life begins at the moment of fertilization. If you read any biology textbook, any embryology textbook, that's what it's gonna state. And so the morning after pill, once a baby is conceived, and you take the pill, it, it kills that human life. And so we would say that that is also murder. That's my, that would be our view on that issue. I because, disagree with that fervently, mostly because cell division, the way a cell works, complex organisms, there's not even a brain yet in the morning after. So why? You're basically saying it has to be more developed for it to count as a life. When does it count as a life then in your worldview? I'd say by the time it's having dreams, because this is, I know you may have stereotyped me as an atheist, but I'm not. I believe there's something out there. Okay. I believe dreams are a visage of the soul. Okay. I know that's kind of Eastern thought, but it's what I've seen. Okay. I have so, a question then. Yeah. So like some, 
Well, so what about the people that get dreams every once in a while? Like, say, what if I have a, go to bed tonight and don't have a dream? Am I a person or am I not a person? That's the funny thing about dreams. Even if you don't remember them, you're having them. The, a lot of, a lot of, I don't know the scientific name for the person who studies the brain, but a lot of right. those guys have determined that the dream cycle is essential for sleep. Okay. So with that, if you're saying you have to start having dreams to be considered conscious, but then we're not conscious of it, doesn't that kind of go against your argument in a sense? Because if it depends on being able to have dreams, but sometimes we have dreams without being conscious of them, it, it doesn't make sense to say, my point in bringing that up is, it wouldn't make sense to say you have to be con conscious for it to be wrong. If I were to break into someone's house, or so, let's say someone to break into my house, and they were to murder me in my sleep and say I was completely unaware of it, unconscious of it, wouldn't that still be wrong? Oh, definitely, but that's apples to oranges because there's a difference between the experience of dreaming and the act of, I don't know what method you were envisioning your own demise, but that. But by what standard does dreams determine that that constitutes life? I, I know it's a very flimsy argument. It's just what I've grown to believe in my own experience of the okay. world. Because earlier you said it's de just earlier you said you don't believe in objective truth, but then just now you said it would definitely be wrong for someone to come into a house and murder me. So that shows that you are presupposing objective truth in this argument. Again, argumentation and conversation is only possible by first presupposing the triune God, by presupposing that which is objectively true, and that is founded in the character of God. That's. How do we know God is the staple of objective truth is my question. Well, you know it the same way I know it. The scriptures say that the heavens reveal the glory of God, the sky above proclaim His handiwork. We're all born in the image of God and we're, we've been given an immediate knowledge of God. So you don't have to configure, okay, I see a tree, it must have had a creator. You just immediately know in your conscience. It's an immediate knowledge. Not immediate, but an immediate knowledge. And so again, it's the same way that I know, but the reality is in our sin, what we do is we hold down the truth of God and unrighteousness. But His invisible attributes and uh, His divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So we are all without an excuse. The Greek is unapologetus, it means without an apologetic. And so you and I, everyone who's alive on this earth, does not have an apologetic to say that they don't know God. And so we know that He's the objective standard of truth because we're born in His image and because He's clearly revealed that, self, that Himself to us in creation. Could, I know you have to go soon. Could I share the gospel message with you before you go? Just very briefly. Okay, so we've all sinned, right? The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Before we sinned, there was, there was no sin in the world. Adam brought sin and death. The Bible says, for as an Adam all die. But the good news of the gospel is that in Christ all shall be made alive. So even though sin brought death into the world, what Christ did was He obeyed the law of God perfectly. He never lied. He never said God's name in vain. He never looked with lust. He never did any of the things that me and you are both guilty of. By the way, I'm Will. I didn't catch your name. My name's Norman. Pleasure. Norman. Norman, good to, good to meet you. Good I'm name. Charlie. Um, this is Charlie. Mason. And Mason. Um, so, so we've failed God's law, but what Jesus did, He's God in the flesh. He's the one who upholds the universe by the word of His power. He entered into time, born of a virgin. The mighty God co comes to bring peace. It prophesied in Isaiah 53, it's in the Tanakh, that he would be pierced for our transgressions, that he would be crushed for our iniquities, that upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. And so, in Christ, you can be salvifically healed. In Christ, you can have forgiveness. And that's why we're talking about how there's, I guess it's on the other side of your sign, abortion is murder, but forgiveness for murder can be found in Jesus Christ alone. So this is a message um, that's not limited to how sinful we are. Jesus said, I came not, not to, to the righteous, but to sinners. He came to save sinners from their sin. And so this is a glorious reality because we all qualify. The Bible says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So Christ comes, He lives a sinless life, He dies the death that we deserve because the wage of sin is death and He emerges victorious from the grave. He defeats death, hell, and the grave. And if we would trust in Him, we would be united to His death, burial, and resurrection. I'm a new creation in Christ now, and I am seen as perfectly righteous, even though I've sinned, even though I've lied, I've stolen. I, I used to smoke methamphetamines, I did ecstasy, I, I fornicated. I did all of these things that God hates, 
and yet he was merciful to me. And the Bible says that the mercies of the Lord are new every morning. So what do you think about that, Norman? I'm happy you've cleaned your life up. It's, meth is a horrible thing, and I'm happy for you getting off it. Yeah, but I mean this, I, I appreciate the sentiment, but the reality is we all need Christ. We all need the Savior. So it's not just this is what works for me. This is, this is what we all need. He's the solution to all sin in the world. And because God is just, He's going to punish every single sin. The question is, will that sin have been punished on Christ where your record of debt can be nailed to the cross? Or will you stand before God and give an account for every action, thought, and deed, everything you ever did? Um, and so this is good news because we can be saved, we can be delivered, no longer slaves of sin, but rather be redeemed by the blood of Christ and be made um, slaves of righteousness. And that's where there's true freedom. I've heard a bit of this before. I was raised Christian with my family. Sure. I'm not much of a Christian now, I'll be honest. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. What What is preventing you from coming to the Christ that you know? I suppose... I don't know how to phrase it. I'm thinking of the words. Okay. Take your time. One of the things is... If there is a God, and I honestly don't know, I cannot put a stake into whether or not I know. I know I'm going to, if there is, I'm going to face him, and if he's not, I don't need to worry about it. Questions for later, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the scriptures tell us that our life is but a vapor, it's but a mist. It's here one day and it's gone the next. A lot of us will hear about the grace of God and we'll presume upon it, or we'll, we'll listen to the story on about the thief on the cross, right, and say, well, he got forgiven right before he was going to die. But that story is meant to lead us to recognize how merciful and gracious God is. Rather than saying, well, I'll put it off till the end, there's a call to believe immediately because we don't have tomorrow promise. And that's why the scriptures say today is the day of salvation, that now is the favorable time, that we can be reconciled to God. The Bible says, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So in that passage, it's indicating that Christ became this, uh, the legal representative of sin. So my sins were on the cross, my meth addiction, my lying, my stealing, my coveting, my fornication, everything evil that I ever did against God was nailed to the cross. And Je Jesus was treated as if he lived my sinful life. And then now that I've been given the gift of faith, I'm treated as if I lived the righteous life of Christ. So God the Father can see me and see perfect righteousness. And so that's, that's the message, man. It's a message of life, hope, forgiveness, reconciliation, redemption. These are all Christian categories that only make sense in the Christian worldview. I disagree with that. Life, forgive. I guess forgiveness is more of a Christian thing, but also guilt is a Christian thing. Mm -hmm. Some, again, I've read a bit of Eastern thought. Sure. Some, oh God, what was it? I'm sorry, I'm trying to... My mm -hmm. brain is frazzled because I studied all night, okay? I got you, man. I totally understand. Yes, I remember those days. <laughs> yeah. It's an interesting thing. Mm -hmm. I have my own beliefs on the world, and I know some of them are wrong. I know I'm going to be wrong someday. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. Well, man, I would just encourage you, Norman, to come to Christ, because again, he's, he, it says he's the way, the truth, and the life, that no one comes to the Father if not through him. Um, and to put, for you to push back and say, well, there's these concepts, you've already rejected objective truth. And so to say that there is forgiveness and there is redemption, there is these things without Christ, and then on the other hand to say there's no objective truth, you're making an objective truth claim. And I bring that up because it demonstrates that you know God, because you're living in His world, you can't escape it. It's an inescapable reality. And so Norman, I'll just, I can't, we're not trying to force a decision out of you right here, sitting here at this moment, but the gospel is simple. It's a free gift of grace. Forgiveness is found in Christ alone. The scriptures say if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
So I just, I pray that you would just think about these things, man. And I don't want to let you, make you any more late for your exam, but these I are really important. Time, but I okay. Need to study. Okay, man. Well, hey, thank you. Thank you so much for stopping. Read those tracks. Do you own a Bible? Would you mind if I gave I you a Bible? I do have a Bible. Okay. okay. Would you know what translation it is? It's, I think, King James. King James. Do you, if you'd want something, there's nothing wrong with the King James. It's just, it's written in a little bit older English. If you want something that's more modern, but still accurate to the Greek and the Hebrew. We have a few Bibles over here if you'd want to take one. We hand them out for free, so it's no charge. You just go and take it. I think I'm good with what I've got. Okay. I, I'd like to acquire, I, I like to acquire books at my own pace. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Have a good one. You God bless. Nice talking to you. Yeah, nice talking to you too. That was really good. Good job, Charlie. <laughs> yeah, I had to ask awesome. about the dream thing. I'm like, that really helped me because yeah. I was like, what's going on? But then it got my, me thinking.